so let's get started so good morning everyone so we start with virtualization today and i'll be taking your training on virtualization then uh, windows and linux systems and also a bit on databases and followed by some networking concepts so remember that we are not going to take these sessions are just to give you an overview we are not taking a full deep dive into the sessions so yes so the whatever information you will be you will be seeing is mostly just the tip of the iceberg so it's not the in depth knowledge transfer that you're getting so it's just introducing you to the topic there's definitely a lot to cover and yes so there's a lot of topics to learn through but we will just be introducing the subjects to you so getting started with virtualization so first of all why is virtualization required a few of the benefits are listed over here first of all it gives you server consolidation that is also called as workload consolidation better security and reliability for application using the same host testing of the software concurrently with production use of a host disaster management now before that we will understand what is virtualization and even before we go ahead with virtualization we need to understand what is a virtual resource virtual resources so the standard definition for that is an illusion of a resource supported by an os through the use of a real resource now what motivated for us to use these real to use virtualization is to have more number of resources available to have more number of resources available such as your virtual memory your cpu the number of hosts the concept was originated in 1960s so though the concept was available way long time back however the machines were not that powerful at that time and you do not see virtualization before the 20th century before the 21st century actually so only after the computers started getting more stronger and now the much powerful computers you see virtualization is more widespread the usage of virtualization is more widespread now a virtual resource is an abstraction so the os implements the abstraction to the use of real resources the implementation can change without affecting the application using the virtual resource an application can be migrated to any host offering the same abstraction so the main feature or you can say the main benefit when it comes to virtualization is portability we can also use virtual resources with standard io devices so that also gives you more io devices available per virtual resource each user could have its own io device configured also another main usage of virtualization is to better optimize your larger memory and another benefit is to manage the uh, large memory you can also split your virtualization to multiple oss and give the users individual virtual machines so that they can run the applications of their own choice a virtual machine could be used in other contexts as well so they can be used for virtualizing programming languages so they can also be used so many of the programming programming languages since a long time use virtualization inside them by themselves so most common is java everybody knows about java virtual machine it's an abstraction that installs on all flavors of the operating system let it be a linux let it be a windows mac os even phones phones also run java so that's also using virtualization at a level we will talk about that a bit later so once again we we'll come back to what is virtualization virtualization is the process of mapping the resources 
and interfaces of a virtual resource into the resources and interfaces of a host machine. The initial issues that came with virtualization were first of all complexity, then came its correctness that includes reliability, security, and also performance. So now these are the early days of computation where we had the limited CPU, limited memory. We're not talking of the days when we started having GBs of RAM, when they were MBs of RAM and also KBs of RAM. So virtualization, though concepted during those times, was not at all used because there was too much overhead when it came to the resource mapping. And the performance gain and the benefits of virtualization were not achieved because of the huge overhead of performance they had on the underlying layer. So it was not very widespread during those days. Virtualization was not at all used. It only started being used in the 21st century. That is the later, you can say past many years, a uh, decade or two where virtualization has been more widely used. So what does virtualization do? Virtualization virtualizes your devices. So it maps an operation of a virtual resource into an operation of a real resource. Nowadays, it is possible to achieve through minimal overhead. OS may map several virtual devices into the same real device. So thus, if you have devices having multiple or requirements so you can have them individually virtualized and mapped to them applications that require individual devices so they also can be virtualized virtual memory manager maps part of the memory into the real memory so does it removes the overhead of loading and removing pages from the memory so this was again a very heavy operation when it comes to the olden days machines Whereas the new machines are more memory optimized, more virtualization optimized. So they give you more better features when it comes to virtualization. So when you have a virtual machine running under the operating system, that is known as a guest virtual machine. Whereas the virtual machine that is Hosting the virtualization software or the virtual machine is known as your host machine. The main objective of virtualization that when you select an hardware is that you should have a machine that would incur minimal overhead. If it's going to take a lot of resources to run your virtual machine, not the guest OS, the guest OS may consume a lot of resources depending upon the operation that you have, but your host machine should be able to enable your guests to be able to run your guests with minimal overhead. So that is the objective of running your virtual machine. So who performs the part of virtualization? The two ways virtualization can be performed. First of all is your virtual machine operating system. So you need an operating system that supports virtualization. Majority of the operating systems that are available nowadays in the market, they support virtualization. Yes, not all of them support, but majority of them do support. Any operating system that has been released, you can say post uh, 2005 does support virtualization in one way or another. But you do have minimal operating system that may not have the support. That's why we say majority of the operating systems do have that feature. Next we have is an virtual machine monitor. That is a software that actually does your virtualization that helps your operating system get virtualized on an host. This is also known as a hypervisor. Now we should not confuse hypervisor with Hyper-V. Hyper-V is a feature of Windows that provides the hypervisor facility. So Microsoft has taken that name known as Hyper-V. 
So we will be seeing that when we do our Windows training, we will have a look of, we will just do, we will discuss about Hyper-V, but the hypervisor for Microsoft is known as Hyper-V. When you come to Linux, it's QMU, Q U, uh, sorry, Q M, uh, sorry, it's Q E M U. So that is the hypervisor that you have on Linux. Uh, you also have VirtualBox. So VirtualBox again is a broad platform hypervisor. It works both on Windows and also on Linux. So that's another open source free hypervisor that's available. It is free to download and install onto your machines. Likewise, hypervisor or uh, Hyper-V for Windows is inbuilt into your operating system. Any laptop that you have bought after 2019, so that would have Windows 10 on it. You have an additional feature that you can enable within your operating system known as the hypervisor. So that is something that you can enable on the machine, any desktop machine which has, uh, yeah, you do need a license for that. So any machine that has Windows Pro or above does support Hyper-V on its system. So you can get it installed and just get configured with the click of a mouse. You just need to add the feature on your system. Linux, you can download the package and add. Now, again, now this is hardware dependent. Not all machines support hyper virtualization. So for these specific features to work, you need your machine to support something known as Slate, second level address translation. This enables your hypervisor to work in a more optimized mode. Now, what does a VM provide? We already discussed a couple of points. So first of all, it should have a low overhead so that it does not overburden your operating system. And also, that is the host operating system and also so that you can have multiple hosts running on it, sorry, your guests running on it. So that is the objective of your virtualization. If you're not able to run multiple guests, then it defeats your purpose of virtualization. Then it also works as a scheduler. So virtualization, like you said, like we already saw, it runs multiple, like we discussed, it's all, it runs multiple guests. So how do the guests know what operation should be run at a time? So it schedules the operations. In the modern operating system, the executions are much faster. So we barely know which, so the execution into the CPU is much faster and it goes on at a much faster rate. Hence the scheduler also performs in a much better manner. Not previously possible, but yes, now in the modern architecture, you can say past a decade, it has been very fast. Hence, also you see the emergence of cloud and all. They also make use of virtualization at a very basic level. Another benefit that you see of virtualization is non-interference. It does not allow a virtual machine OS to execute privileged instructions. The guest OS runs in user mode. Now, previously, you could say in the operating system around four to five years back, the operating systems were not virtualization aware. So any guest OS would assume that it was running like on an host OS and would consume more resources on an environment. Whereas nowadays we get OSs that are virtualization optimized. Hence, they are aware that the underlying operating system is a guest and it is running on a host. Hence, it defers several tasks that are normally run on an operating system to the host OS and hence reduces the overhead on an virtual machine. So the feature that we discussed, the slate feature, second address, second level address translation. So that feature directly allows the guests 
to interact with the CPU and the memory so that the overhead is reduced. The general flow of activities would be from the guest OS to the host OS and then to the underlying hardware. Whereas by having this feature enabled, having native virtualization support available, this overhead is avoided. The guests can now directly perform activities using the CPU of the host. Now again, remember, though it can directly perform the activities, it cannot perform privileged activities. It can only perform guest activities that are not privileged on the, on the host. When you say privileged instructions, maybe it could be removing off a disk, removing off a, or maybe upgrading the BIOS or making some change on the host operating system. Maybe some permission change or deleting certain files on the operating system. So that what is out of the guest will not be allowed on the host machine. So the host machine would restrict those type of instructions. Whereas anything within the guest, within the domain of the guest OS would be allowed by the host machine. So there are two, term, two types of virtualizations available. One is your full virtualization that gives the full host machine and the guest machine have the identical capabilities. So one of the major drawback of this type of virtualization is that you cannot migrate your virtual machines to an other machine that would have a different architecture. That is, if you're using, say, a virtual machine which may have an i7 processor and you have another machine running an i5 processor, you cannot migrate your machine because it is a fully virtualized machine. In case your i7 machine crashes, you cannot move that machine. So it, this defeats your purpose of virtualization. That is the portability part goes away. The most commonly used part of virtualization, most commonly used type of virtualization, para virtualization, it uses some of the host machine instructions and the remaining are just virtualized by other instructions that are more generic. Hence what this gives us is portability. So you can run the machine on any type of virtualization host. So you are not restricted now by the hardware. You take this type of machine to any host, let it be on an i7, let it be on an i5. You can move it to an AMD. It would work fine. Okay, the same thing that we just discussed. Another benefit of para virtualization is to provide more CPU modes. So it prevents interference by letting the host OS, guest OS and application use different CPU modes. Hence it is a more generic CPU and that's why more easily migratable. It provides easily virtualizable features. So you don't have to worry of the features since it is para virtualized and it would be identical, let it be on any machines. Now, ideally in a data center, you would always have machines of the same configuration. It would be very rare where the, where the configuration would differ. However, when you consider upgrades, as you get new machines coming out, new hardware coming out into the market, and you would look to an upgrade, then having para virtualization enabled and used is more beneficial because that would enable easy migration and upgrades. We already discussed this part of having support by the operating system for virtualization. So another benefit that para virtualization gives is with the portability also comes your disaster management. So since you can port a virtual machine between machines, if your one host crashes, you can have it ported easily to an other machine. So there are many architectures that are supported that allow you to have always on configuration between two hosts. So that's another advanced topic, but yes, it can be done. So those type of scenarios are supported. You're not limited to run your host 
on one your guests on one machine only you can have it moving around several machines and this also gives you both your fault tolerance and reliability sorry it's called fault tolerance and disaster recovery so both of those are covered because of the virtualization of portable uh, portability Okay, so this ends our slide that I had for you. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, so we'll uh, discuss another thing. We'll see how the operating system is actually virtualized. So before that, we need to know what is an operating system. So this is going back a bit to our college days where we studied a bit about the operating system. Sorry, just give me a moment. So we generally say a picture is worth thousand words. So this is how we view a operating system. Hope my screen is shared. Okay, sorry, not shared yet. Okay, so it's Wikipedia to the rescue. So Wikipedia does have a lot of good generic articles that explain virtualization in very basic terms. Yes, and they are quite good. So what is virtualization when you see with uh, the respect of an operating system or you can say with respect to hardware. So whenever we see an operating system, what does the operating system do? It's supposed to give you an plain of what you say, it gives your application and common interface to interact with your hardware. So that is the purpose of your operating system. So let you run any application on any type of hardware. For example, you can say your notepad or your paint application or your Gmail application. You can open it anywhere. You can open it on your phones. You can open it on a Windows computer. You can open it on a Linux computer. You can open it on Macintosh computers. All of them have different hardware. All of them have different kernels. All of, but you can still run the same application on all those devices. Why? Because you have the kernel. The kernel is responsible for interpreting the data from the application and converting it into a meaningful format for you. So that's why you always have an operating system before you, uh, you always have a good UI. You have an operating system before you use your computer. So the first thing after you get a hardware is that you turn on into your operating system. If it does not have an operating system, the first thing you will do is that you will install an operating system. Now the operate, not all operating system have a UI. So another thing that you need to remember, operating system also comes with CLI. That's your command line interface. They are not good. So what we see the wonderful GUI that we have over here on the Chrome browser and all many operating system, especially 
Linux operating system, mainframe operating systems, they do not have a UI. When it comes again to operating system, there are several type of operating system that you have. So you have real time operating system, and then you have these operating system, which we use, which are which use scheduled tasks and activities. So most of the operating system that you get on the market are the normal operating system that use schedulers. Whereas the real time OSs, so they are mainly used for banking applications and are used, uh, they are the mainframe applications. So generally not used by the open public, but yes, they are also very commonly used. And these are mainly factored, manufactured by IBM and quite expensive servers as well. Now, when it comes to virtualization on this, where does your virtualization come in this picture? Your virtualization comes above the kernel. So above the kernel, you will have a virtualization, your hypervisor. The best comparison I have is to compare your OS versus your VM and versus nowadays you have the next concept that's come, those are containers. So you should remember there's the next level of virtualization that's your containers. The same thing that we discussed. So this picture again explains everything. So what we were seeing so far is your virtualizations. You have your infrastructure, so your operating system, you have your CPUs, RAM, everything that, and including your networking. So not to forget, sorry, I left out the networking part. Your networking part is also nowadays virtualized. So you don't need to go and configure physical networks. Those two are virtualized and are capable of get being virtualized. So the same thing, the same concepts that we saw, your hardware, below line hardware is virtualized. Above that you have is your hypervisor. The hypervisor is responsible for your virtualization. So again, that we saw the hypervisor could be any software. It could be your Hyper-V in Windows. It could be Qemu in uh, Linux. Macintosh has parallels. Then you have the cross-platform virtual box. You could use any hypervisor. It qualifies as a hypervisor because it can run guest OS. On your guest OS, you will have your libraries, your binary files that supports your application. When you say your binary library files, this could be maybe your Chrome. Your application could be Gmail. Or maybe you could call your libraries as Java. Over that, you will have your application running. So that could be another example. But when it comes to containers, so the containers take your virtualization to an other level. It takes it another level up. So as we see over here, we have the hypervisor that virtualizes the guest operating system. Whereas when it comes to your containers, it will not virtualize your operating system. Whereas it will run above your operating system, only virtualizing the libraries and the applications. So this removes an other overhead. So virtualization goes one more step ahead over here. It takes out the need of having the operating system as well. The operating system, like we discussed, would have its complete overhead. First of all, you would need your the disk space to install your operating system. Then you would have to install all the libraries required for the operating system to work along with drivers that would interface with the various IOS system. So that again is eliminated when you come to containers. Now, when we discussed virtualization just for the operating system, so that virtualizes your devices. It could be your keyboard, your mouse, or your network interface, the RAM, the CPU, all those things would get virtualized. Whereas when it comes to containers, you're not virtualizing the keyboards, the mouse, you're not virtualizing the RAM. 
all your virtualizing is your application, the libraries that it would be used. Again, now these would be isolated from each other. However, this does have a drawback. Since the operating system is shared, the input is shared. So any interrupts and all are dependent on your host operating system. So that is not independent. Whereas Hyper-V gives you the complete isolation and security because it virtualizes all the resources of an operating system that includes your security. So when you say your network is virtualized, so every feature of the network, including the firewall, including the filtering, everything is virtualized. Also the addresses, the MAC addresses, the IP addresses, all of them would get virtualized together and they would be isolated from each other. Whereas when you say about containers, you do not virtualize the network interface. You do not virtualize several other firewalls, the security features. Because of that, this is one of the drawbacks you can say when it comes to containers. So you do not have that type of security. But to overcome it, generally what is said is that we should run known containers together on a single host so that security does not become an issue. Whereas unknown containers that need to be secured, that may be uh, containers of different applications or maybe different projects or clients, or you could go to the level of different organizations. So they should be running on different hosts so that the security feature is maintained when it comes to containers. Whereas virtual machines are not constrained by this. Why they are not constrained by this? Because they have their own guest OS. The guest OS will have all the security features that includes your antivirus. Everything would be installed onto the guest OS. And with the modern Again, hardware improving a lot. You also have encryptions enabled, both at the host level encryption. Then you also have encryption at the guest level. So both of the encryptions are supported when it comes to virtual machines. Whereas in containers, these options are limited because they are just doing application virtualization. Now, uh, when we come to cloud, uh, like we discussed, Hello. cloud does use a uh, of virtualization. Yes, tell me. Uh, sir, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Like a uh, virtual machine and containers, you told that. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, where I can apply, means the virtual machine, sometimes I have some uh, doing the front end code, the back end code, the database. Mm -hmm. So that time, uh, the enterprise architecture or normal architecture, they will provide me the VM. One VM, dedicated VM, they will provide, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing all the steps over there and add it to the VM. But inside the, uh, so in which case, I will put the containers instead of virtual machines. Because virtual machines, all the dedicated stuff, I will be put over there, right? Correct. So which case, I will add the containers. Because I cannot understand that. Uh, in uh, some of the cases, the virtual machine will be considered and when I can consider the containers instead of in the resources, I have to separate it to different virtual machines. That yeah. is my question. See, that is a good question actually. So containers like we discussed, see, the security is not that much as much it comes to virtual machine. Virtual machine will give you complete isolation. If your application okay. is required, has the security requirement, it needs to be completely isolated. It needs to have its own set of rules, own set of management. So that is where your virtual machines get more, give more value add. And that is how it actually started. You always start, you can say, it started with virtual machines. Containerization came later on. So this okay. came where, where you had, say, one application but you needed to run several instances of that application. Like say you have a 
say an application a chat application so you require mm-hmm. somebody to connect on port 80 but mm-hmm. you require but you will have hundreds of people who would be chatting at the same time so now in such a way having just one virtual machine and uh, requesting handling that request becomes an overhead whereas if you have say 100 containers that mm-hmm. are catering to this request so that optimizes your system so you can tell that uh, we can manage virtual machine inside the containers right means when no, 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 no. that is not how it works so you will have you can have either hypervisor your vms or you mm-hmm. can have containers you cannot have inside containers you cannot have an other virtual machine okay so that is how it does not work that's why you see the architecture over here it shows you mm-hmm. clearly you have your infrastructure then you have your hypervisor Huh, then I, I understand that so, uh, you have the guest OS. So you don't okay, have the okay. OS. Within the guest OS, you cannot run an other guest OS. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and uh, when I have uh, many virtual machines, right? Means hundred uh, or two hundred virtual machines. That time, how can I manage this virtual machine? Because uh, the users are different OS. Like right. somebody are using the operating system Windows, somebody Linux. so the code is different a code is same but the underlying operating system is different Correct. so that time how can i manage all the virtual machine because there are different um, architecture over there are different Correct. software they can use that kind Correct. of thing how can i manage yes so that is the role of your hypervisor so your hypervisor does the virtualization your hypervisor also gives you an interface to interact with the virtual machines to create okay. it, to destroy it to manage hello where the hypervisor is installed yeah can you please see uh, through your system is uh, hypervisor where it can be installed now in our systems you know we do not have access to install it but yes you do have that feature yes yes so can add remove programs you will go over there let me see whether it launches okay, okay. let's come over here so within this optional features we definitely cannot add but yes your there should be an option for hyper v and it will interpret i think that right means me yes. my operating system and then the content yes but this needs to be enabled on your hardware also so mm. now there is a feature in the bios that prevents mm. you from running hypervisor on your machine now it depends on the admin if they have allowed the feature you can mm. install it the first check it will do is that it will check whether your system is capable of running hyper b or not if it does okay. not find that feature enable it will straight away let you know that you cannot install hyper v on your machine mm-hmm. and then you cannot run hypervisor you cannot run hypervisor you cannot run a guest os and neither you can run container engines the container engines also require hypervisor these day before they were not mandatory but now for better performance it's also required for your container engines okay so hypervisor will have an interface now that mm-hmm. is what we will see when we are running or uh, learning windows and also we will see when we are doing our labs so uh, um we'll see whether we can do labs actually yes but yeah and the instance i will create a machine and show it to you on okay. uh, azure so that gives you the full interface uh, that is the cloud sfi what ip address you want to give your system how you want to connect to your system what mm-hmm. ports you want to open everything it will mm-hmm. listed out to you so you mm-hmm. want to, so you have all those options you need to fill it out whereas where if you go to an cloud provider they do mm-hmm. not give you the option of installing an operating system you have mm-hmm. to use they are already pre defined operating systems so they have their images already ready you just mm-hmm. need to select that and they will set it up and give it to you again now this is automated so this is mm-hmm. another type of virtualization where the images are pre built all you need to do is make use of those images by mm-hmm. just selecting the options so your hypervisor is ready your guest infrastructure your host infrastructure is ready all mm-hmm. you need to do is select what guest os you want and even going step further it also allows you to select what you want to get installed and configured on it so those options also are available in the modern hypervisor mm-hmm. so you may not call your cloud provider as a hypervisor exactly because they provide you more services 
beyond hypervisor so mm-hmm. they are also providing you services so the or comes the concepts of pass sas mm. as yes yes as yes. so yes. these all concepts come over here so when you say infrastructure as a service so that is basically your hypervisor so most mm. many providers like you can say and they will manage our infrastructure we don't correct. need to do no need to think about the infrastructure we only write the code and uh, update over this infrastructure right oh, correct so those and are sir, one thing i understand this part but one thing i can say that means i can get that virtual box okay the oracle has given the virtual boxes so what can i say the virtual box can be a virtual machine or there is difference virtual box and the virtual machine mm. because when i install the virtual box that will also consume my own resources like like my right. operating right. system all mm. the things yes yeah, so, so and the virtual machine also so can right. what is the difference virtual box and virtual machine yeah so like i told see, virtual box is your open source solution for a hypervisor so virtual box is not your virtual machine virtual box is your hypervisor that means okay. it will provide you the capability of running virtual machines on your operating system just like hyper v virtual box is an other solution but it's an open source solution okay so it is not your vm it is your hypervisor it will provide you the capability of running vms mm. using the virtual box hypervisor so when you install virtual box it gives you the full interface of everything they will get yes and everything okay so inside the virtual machine i also install the virtual boxes right means and that can be possible you can install you can also run virtual machines inside a virtual machine no doubt you can do that nobody is going to stop you from doing that but no. now again comes back to the question of the overhead when overhead. you run a virtual machine within a virtual machine you are running first of all you have your host os mm. then you have your first guest os which is running again within that your virtual box and you are running a third okay. guest os within that so, so it's a called a layer based system all the layers should be coming one by one. Oh, yeah. one after another yeah so that gives you so much overhead is that it does not give you the benefit of the mm-hmm. okay your memory utilization will go high then your cpu also will unnecessarily be used for running a guest within a guest so mm-hmm. people generally do not do that not, yes, not yes. no no i understand but i just that wanted to know that if i will use that time it will possible or not means that will be any um, possible only thing is that the overhead becomes so much that it's yes. not feasible Easily. people do do run that but it's not a feasible option okay we generally would run a host and on that you will run the guest so most mm-hmm. of the operating most of your guest operate hypervisor they will mm-hmm. not let you install a guest vm within a guest so mm-hmm. now if you look at your operating system also i don't know mm-hmm. if you ever noticed this part mm-hmm. Just see where the you can see my screen again. No, no, the screen is not visible. I hope. Yeah, I'm just sharing again. Yeah. Okay, so if you see any modern operating system, if you have seen, so now I'm sharing my screen over here. Mm. You can see over here. I've opened the task manager. Yes. Any new modern operating system you will go to, so I think so after 2015 or 2016. Yeah. they will check how is the os installed so over here since i'm this is my local machine dashboard yes. this is not a virtual machine it says clearly over here virtual is enabled yeah virtualization enabled that means this is a physical machine whereas when i will open a linux whenever i open a virtual machine it will clearly write and show me show it over here that it is a virtual machine So this is another point that we discussed during the slide that I was presenting. Mm-hmm. That nowadays we do have operating systems that are virtualization enabled. That mm-hmm. means they know that they are a virtual operating system. Hence, they do not consume that much resources that would otherwise be consumed on a host machine. Mm-hmm. So they delegate those activities, those tasks to the a uh, host OS. and mm. that your virtualization experience becomes more better 
So Windows 10 yes. is one of those operating system. Windows 7 is not virtualization enabled. So by default, it's, this is available, I think that, but there is no. no it's or, not or, aware. So sorry, it mm -hmm. supports virtualization. You can install VirtualBox on, on that and you can use, there is no Hyper-V on Windows 7, mm -hmm. but you can install VirtualBox. You can use the Hyper, you can use VirtualBox as your hypervisor. Mm -hmm. But can Windows use 7 it. is not virtualization aware. Okay, so okay. that is the difference. It is not virtualization aware. Every instance that you will install, it will consider like it's installed on the host OS mm -hmm. and it will operate as that. So when you compare the performance say, of a Windows 10 machine on virtualization and a Windows 7 machine on virtualization, you may notice that Windows 10 will work a bit better. Yeah, but again, it depends on the hardware that you're running on. If your hardware is not capable of running at that speed, then you may find both of them going slow. Yeah, yeah. That also counts. It. So there are several factors that impacts. Mm -hmm. yes. but this is the main feature that now enables. That's why we will mostly hear the term when an operating system is launched, whether it is virtualization enabled or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, mostly it is called uh, virtualization uh, aware. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you explain to some uh, Azure or AWS the demo how to means a virtual machine you can install from the cloud servers because cloud server all the system are configured over there, na? So, so that is it... uh, yeah that class is there for you. Okay, so okay. be covered by someone else. So I hmm. think hopefully it AWS is. session is there. So hmm. hopefully these topics will come within that. Okay. Okay, so those topics are there. So I'm just giving you a general virtualization. Here, right? Yes. Thank so you see, I'm not even installing anything on a virtual machine and all because the time frame is not sufficient to give you a hands-on on that. As I mm -hmm. we could have taken that part also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Anvesh, you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah, Sandeep. Uh, actually, I'm not very clear with the uh, guest OS and host OS. Can you please again explain? Yeah, when you say your host OS, so this operating system that you're seeing now, now on my screen, that's called your host OS. Now within this, if I run a VM, so I can run VMs, I can run an other OS within my operating system. So that will become your guest OS. Now within, on my host OS, I can run only one operating system at a time. If I want to say now I'm having Windows on my machine, if I want to run Linux, what will I have to do? I'll have to take a Linux bootable, insert it into my computer, format my hard disk, and then run, install with Linux onto it. And then after the Linux installation is completed, I'll be able to use my machine as a Linux machine. Whereas, say I want to use a guest VM, a guest virtual machine of Linux, then I, without touching my underlying hardware, I can just use the hypervisor and install my guest Linux. So my entire host operating system, whatever apps I have installed will remain there really. Whereas the guest will just get configured as a virtual machine. Now tomorrow say I want to have a Windows VM. I don't need to uninstall. I don't need to delete my existing Linux VM that I already created. I can just create a new VM and install Windows onto that and make use of it. Tomorrow, say I need an other Linux VM, say some other flavor, or maybe a Windows Server VM I need. Again, I can follow the same step. So I will just I will just install the new operating system onto a new VM without touching the previous two operating systems. So I have the choice either I reinstall on them or I just create a new VM. Again, now that will consume my resources, both the hard disk, CPU, and RAM if they are active. I remember the term if they are active. So if they are not active, they are not going to consume a CPU and RAM. But if you leave them on and running, they will consume the CPU and RAM on your system. Okay, got it, Sandeep. Thanks. So, uh, so, so Sandeep, I have one question. Yes, so much. Uh, yeah, so for uh, hypervisor, so uh, basically, uh, for a specific operating system, uh, which hypervisor is uh, means 
performance is good. I mean, suppose if you are using Windows hypervisor or Linux or any other hypervisor, so so it, the, does the performance depends upon that, or it is totally dependent on the hardware and 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 the hypervisor performance? Yeah. So now this question again, I would say it depends because nowadays you do get hypervisor compatible hardware. So Microsoft has tie-ups with several vendors who provide Hyper-V optimized hosts. Then VMware is another major hypervisor provider. They have their own hypervisor called as ESX. So sorry, I did not uh, mention this before. So I will be discussed about Linux and Windows. So the third major competitor is your VMware. So they have ESX. So now they have their own custom hypervisor, which they have uh, they are maintaining, and it's a paid software, so not an open source. You need to have a subscription from them. And yes, so they have their own hardware. They don't manufacture it. They do specify the specifications, which hardware will be more optimized to run their hypervisor. And then obviously they write the drivers accordingly. And this is again basic, okay? So their hosts are very basic. They have a CLI, and you require a separate software to maintain those hosts. Okay. So there are several architectures. So like we see here in Windows, we have the good GUI. So that is not always available. It is only that Windows gives you the good GUI, but uh, Windows. Uh, also has a CLI version. You it's not necessary that you always run your hypervisor with the GUI. Windows also provides a CLI version where you do not have the GUI and you can maintain it using another machine or use the CLI to maintain it. So you have those options. Likewise, VMware ESXi comes only with a CLI. You need a ESX. Uh, sorry, uh, you need a WebSphere. Uh, sorry, I forgot the correct term. VSPR is a software that you use from uh, VMware. VSPR, sorry. It's VSPR is a software that you use from VMware to manage your ESXi host. And above that, you have vCenter server. That's a centralized server that can manage n number of ESXi hosts at a time. So now to the previous question that Amit was asking, like how do you manage? When it comes to bigger data centers, you do not have a single interface. Like VirtualBox is more of your desktop type hypervisor. So that is used to manage just one host. That is the host you have installed it on. Okay, It does not go span across multiple hosts. But when you come to your vSphere, the vCenter especially, then Windows has its VM, uh, vCenter, or sorry, SCVMM. That's your system center virtual machine manager suite. So that gives you the capability of going and managing N virtualization hosts into a single interface. So there are several softwares available to do that, but these are the leading ones that provide you that capability. Hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Welcome. So when you say again the cloud, so the cloud does make use of their own custom the software management that manages several Hyper-V hosts. Again, they have their own architecture of how they do that. That is mostly not disclosed. Neither does Amazon disclose how it does it. Neither does Azure disclose how they do it internally. But yes, they do have a software that manages and automates all these things. So that they don't need to interface with each and every of your requests and also gives you the freedom to work on it. Yes, Jed. Yes, yeah, Sandeep. So uh, I'm just I am curious about uh, as we discuss, uh, there are two approach for virtualization, uh, something mm -hmm. hypervisor and some container engine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we are like uh, creating VM or any container, so uh, in case we use like uh, uh, hypervisor, mm. so we are using host uh, and create some guest, uh, I think OS, right? Mm. Yeah. And while we are uh, using container base, so we are uh, you supposed to use our like host uh, OS only. 
Yeah. So, uh, uh, if you want to like, we have some window base, our ho main host, and we want to like some create a VM or any container uh, Linux base. So, is there any restriction or we can do that? Okay, restriction as in, sorry, I didn't get the last one. Yeah, like, we want to like create new VM, a uh, new virtual machine, mm -hmm. or we want to like create new container. Mm -hmm. But our like base uh, main host is uh, like a particular window base, so we can do that or particular new restriction. Yeah, that will depend on your hypervisor. Now, okay. the hypervisor, like we discussed for virtual machines, is your Hyper V, the ESXi, and then your uh, virtual box parallels in on Mac OS. Whereas when it comes to containers, mainly you have is Docker. Okay. So most problem when I have heard really mainly about Docker, then uh, so you depends on the hypervisor which you use. Now if you're using Docker, then you cannot create VMs out of them. All you can create from them is your containers. Okay. Then when you're using VirtualBox, you cannot create uh, containers from them. You can only create VMs for them. Yeah. You understand? So that will keep your segregation. You cannot use VirtualBox to create uh, Docker containers. And whereas you cannot use Docker to create your VMs. Yeah, yeah, but both uh, cases, uh, this uh, like whatever the flavor or version uh, mm -hmm. that we have, like to, that is depend upon like uh, in uh, hypervisor in case of uh, like this virtual machines, right? And uh, if you want to container, so that depend upon container engines. Is this so? Correct. Or? Correct. Oh, okay. Your container engine should support that, and your hypervisor should support that. Like if you see on your Windows system, you do VirtualBox does support uh, Mac OS. I think VMware supports Mac OS, OS guest, but you cannot install it when you're installing VMware hypervisor on your Windows system. Whereas if you install the same software on, sorry, I'm not sure it's your VirtualBox or VMware, but if you install the same thing on your Macintosh machine, then you can have a guest that is of Macintosh, but that is not supported if you are doing on a Windows or Linux machine. Okay. 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 So that depends on your hypervisor. So if your yeah. hypervisor is capable of providing that virtualization, it will work. Okay. But the same question will come again. If it's working over there and we discussed that it is supposed to give us that parallelism, it's supposed to give us the portability mainly, then why not? It should not work on a Windows system when I install the same hypervisor. Mm -hmm. it's basically, because of the licensing, the so Macintosh does not allow Mac guests on non Macintosh hosts. So, that is the reason you do not see those Macintosh hosts on Windows operating system. Sorry, guests on Windows operating system. Whereas, you can install Windows on a Macintosh host. You can have a guest Windows system on a Macintosh host. So that is how the licensing works. Oh, understand. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. So I think you have a next session scheduled. Yeah. Do you have anything? Yes. The community is already made. You have any questions? Please uh, post your questions over there. And all the best and happy learning. We will see you next on Thursday for the next session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.